Hello Ostrava. The music you're about to hear is made of the waveforms you're about to see. Played back on an oscilloscope. One of these. Well, we had Ashwin just now. There he is. Hello, Hello Ashwin. Hello. <laughs> Hello. So, so this is Dr. Ashwin Vasaveda. He's the project scientist for the Curiosity Mars rover. So he works on this incredible machine which is behind him, uh, which has gone up to Mars and which is still there right now. Um, he's going to run us through some different aspects of the, of the rover. Um, and at the end, you will have a chance to ask Ashwin some questions and then at the very end Ashwin will have a couple of questions for you to win a couple of NASA little NASA prizes so Roger would you like to uh, take take uh, into Ashwin's first segment sure hi Ashwin how are you doing great great to be here good I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit uh, about what the whole Curiosity uh, Mars rover project is about and round about when it started. Sure. Uh, so I'm Ashwin Vasavada. I'm here at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And we're a NASA center, one of about a dozen across the United States. Uh, and our particular center here in Pasadena specializes in putting robots out into the solar system. So we have gotten, uh, we've had a lot of success over the years, starting from the 1960s sending the first robots to ever fly by the planets like uh, Mercury and Venus and Mars, and then out into the, older, the outer solar system with Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune. Uh, so we love doing a lot of work with robots here. We don't work with astronauts specifically. We send our robots to do science. And so what I'll be telling you a little bit about today is the NASA mission called Curiosity, which is a Mars rover. Uh, the rover uh, project started in about 2004, so I've been working on this mission now for 15 years. Uh, but Curiosity landed on Mars in 2012. So since 2012, seven years now, we've been roving across the surface. Okay, that's so, great. Cool. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I, just briefly about uh, why we sent Curiosity. Uh, so Curiosity uh, is a part of NASA's strategy to explore Mars. We have uh, orbiters that are satellites around Mars mapping the surface. Uh, we have rovers that are driving across Mars, all of with a common goal of figuring out if Mars ever supported life. We'd love to see if Mars ever had life originate on its own outside of Earth. And Curiosity plays a special role in that to figure out if Mars ever had the conditions, the temperatures, the amount of water, all those things necessary to support life. That's great. So it's a NASA mission. Um, can you tell me who it was was involved in actually building the rover? And then maybe we can talk about the people who are, who are using it to, uh, to actually try and do the science. Sure. 
Yeah, here at JPL, we built the rover itself, and uh, what's behind me, and we'll talk about in a bit, is a test model, an engineering model of the rover. It's a full-size model. The real one, of course, is now on Mars. So JPL built that. Uh, JPL also built a, uh, another spacecraft, really, that flew this rover down to the surface, and we'll talk about that as well. We have, we have other partners in the U.S. that built the capsule that the rover went to Mars in and the rocket that blasted it off from Florida in the United States. But we also have uh, four out of ten people on the team, 40% of the team, coming from outside of the United States, contributing various instruments and sensors that are now on the rover. Okay. Do you have any idea of which European pr uh, countries are represented? Sure, yeah. Um, in fact, we have uh, sensors that were developed in Spain, in Germany, in France, in Russia, and uh, we have a lot of scientists participating from those countries, as well as the United Kingdom. That's great. Well, maybe it's time that we actually had a look at the rover, and I'll hand over back to Connie while you look around the rover itself. Yeah. Sure. Ash Ashwin, I just want to say we've got a white rectangle on our screen here with what looks like a sound bar at the bottom. I just tried to call Corey. I don't know if he can do something about that. Um, we can see you very, very well, but if he can remove that, that would be very, that would be cool. Um, I actually really want to see this device. I think it, it sounds amazing. Could you, could you show us around? Sh tell us how it works? Sure. Um, we're looking at trying to remove that sound bar. I'm not sure it's on our end. I did ask here, and they said that it's at your end. It, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I don't know. Is it a... Is it obscuring some of the, the shot? We'll work around it. It's not too bad, right? Does it bother anybody, like, terribly? Or are we all going to walk out? I don't think so. No. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. I don't think I even said hi. So let me say hi to the whole audience there. Hi to the Czech Republic. So are we going to say hi back to Ashwin? <laughs> we say hi and you say go. <laughs> all right. We lost him. Okay. I think We're coming back in one second. Oh, We're just trying to get back perfect. in the yeah. Yay! Okay. <laughs> See, that's NASA technology at work for you. <laughs> 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 we can put a rover on Mars. We can get rid of a sound bar. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> that was amazing. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sure, so can you yeah. take Sorry us around about. your machine there? Take us around your toy. Sure, yes. So what, what's behind me is the engineering model of the Curiosity rover. Uh, so this is the full size. It's a vehicle that's uh, purposely built to be able to drive around a rocky surface on Mars and explore a local area, maybe 10 or 20 kilometers in, uh, in total. In fact, over the mission so far, we've driven 21 kilometers. Uh, so since 2012, when we landed, we've driven uh, over uh, 21 kilometers. So that's a, a great um, milestone for us. But what's behind me is a six-wheeled rover. I want to start looking uh, with our eyes, which is what we call the mast. So this rectangular box has, uh, has six different cameras on it, uh, some black and white cameras that the rover uses to navigate itself, as well as some color cameras that we use to do our science. The big box on top it actually holds a laser that we can shoot out up to about uh, seven meters away. And with that laser, we can create a little spark on a rock or a patch of soil and look at the color of that spark and figure out what the rocks or soils are made of. The next thing I want to talk about is the rover's arm. The rover's arm is actually folded up in front of it now, but when it stretches out, it's about two meters long. And at the end of the arm, there's a, a big hand that we call the turret. This arm has really one purpose that it's built around, which is to hold a drill. Now this is a drill that has a, a very sharp bit that can pound into the surface and grind up rocks and collect that powder because the way we do most of our science with this mission is to deliver that powder into laboratories that are located inside the rover. And with those laboratories, we can do things like look at the minerals of the rocks to figure out how much water was on Mars, and we can look for organic molecules, molecules that contain carbon that might either be evidence of ancient life or at least material that life can use if life ever was on Mars. The next thing I'd like to point out is the rover's wheel down um, on the floor here. We have six of these wheels. They're metal. 
we had some problems early in the mission where the wheels were wearing down a little faster than we hoped, but we figured out how to drive a little bit more safely. We're not very good about that in California, but we're better on Mars. You see some holes in the wheels. Uh, these holes are actually markers that we can use every time the wheel spins. It can leave this pattern of holes. Some of our engineers decided that it would be nice to, uh, to have a little marker that said the, word, the letters JPL for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and we could print JPL on Mars every time the wheels rotated. <laughs> but our bosses at NASA would not allow that. Uh, but our engineers here are smart people, so they came up with a way of using the military code, the Morse code, to encode the letters JPL in these small and large uh, dashes and dots. So we're still marking JPL just in a, a slightly more uh, nice way. And a little bit of laser graffiti maybe while you're at it, yeah? On a few uh, rocks. Yeah, we're leaving little blast marks all over Mars and drill holes. Uh, that's the way it goes when you're doing science. So, so the... <laughs> Yes? So the machine, to me, from here, it looks very light, except for the wheels, which you said were metal. How heavy is this whole um, uh, machine? Yeah, the, the rover itself weighs 1,000 kilograms. So it's a ton. And that meant that we had to invent a new way of landing this rover yeah. compared to all the rovers we had landed before. Uh, if, if I can finish one more thing with the tour, I'll just point out the way we communicate before we get into uh, some of the photos that we, had, we brought. Um, I want to point out this antenna in the back. We have two ways of communicating with the rover. One is we can talk directly from the rover to Earth, back and forth. But it's even better for us to talk through the satellites that we have at Mars. So this black cylinder in the back is what we call a relay antenna. It broadcasts all of our pictures and science data to a satellite that we have at Mars, and that satellite beams it back to Earth. And we get about 80 megabytes a day from Mars, so not a lot by Earth standards, but it's a great amount of data when you're sending it from 300 million miles away. Uh, and that's, that's the tour so far. Thank you. So you said that um, somebody is running it. Is there like a pilot? in the control room or do you run on shifts or how, how is that working? Yeah, uh, we have about uh, 100 engineers here at JPL and about 500 scientists around the world, including 40% from uh, countries outside the US. And the engineers, uh, about 30 of those 100 work on a single day and then we have enough so that we can shift, we can schedule them every day that we operate. But 30 of those engineers every day will look at the latest downlink from the rover make sure all the temperatures are good, all the power levels are good, the battery is charged, all the, all the activities we had planned had executed successfully. And then the scientists, of course, we have about 100 scientists or so every day participating, and they will look at what data we acquired in the day before and plan what we hope to do tomorrow. So it's this effort for much more than a single person. We have this team effort every single day, and it's my job as the project scientist to manage that whole process and uh, make sure that we keep this rover as scientifically productive as we can on Mars. Incredible. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year. Uh, you know, we started the mission that way, I'll be honest, uh, but we no longer do that. That would probably put us all in the hospital. So we, uh, Mars, this is interesting too, Mars has a 24 and a half hour day. And so in order to operate as efficiently as you just described, we all lived on Mars time for about three months, where every day we would sleep on a 24 and a half hour day, coming to work a half hour later every day. Uh, but uh, since then, <laughs> we now operate the rover five days a week uh, so that we can have a little bit of a normal life here on Earth. So, so that's when the, the rover goes off and does its shopping for the week and has its rest time on the weekend. Yeah, recharges its batteries quite literally. <laughs> exactly, literally, yeah. Roger? Okay, maybe we can uh, talk a little bit now about what you've actually found with the rover. So I think at this point we're going to switch over to some, uh, some pictures that you sent us. Great. Uh, and there's one person controlling that. That's me. I have control. And we're showing your first slide here. So I know Mars missions are actually quite risky. Uh, maybe you can give us an indication of 
how many of them actually make it to Mars. And you might want to tell us about how you actually got this one ton of equipment down on the surface. Sure, yeah. So what you're looking at in this picture doesn't look risky at all, does it? <laughs> uh, but uh, So over the course of um, the 50, now almost 60 years we've been exploring Mars, uh, the record is about 50% in terms of spacecraft that make it successfully versus those that don't. Uh, but the success rate in the past you know, decade or two has, of course, gone dramatically higher. Uh, we're getting more comfortable and uh, better at landing things successfully. But we don't uh, uh, take it too easy because our first rover was about, this, uh, about the size of um, uh, a microwave oven. Uh, the second rovers we sent were the size of small carts, like a golf cart. Uh, and the rover that, of course, you see behind me now is, uh, is the size of a car. And so we had to invent a new way of landing it. And what this picture shows is that we had to build this other spacecraft that we called the descent stage with eight rockets firing and flying the rover down to the surface. So there was a parachute at first, which slowed it down a little bit, but we needed this rocket craft to actually hold the rover, fly it down the last two or three kilometers to the surface, then lower it down on some ropes as it landed. Don't, sorry, I, sorry I'm going to interrupt. I have a question. Don't you have like a lot of wind or stormy, like when you're bringing that down, isn't that, do you, do you calculate when is the best time to, to drop it? I mean, not drop it. I mean, you know, like land it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, at some point, yeah. you drop it. <laughs> yeah. Um, hopefully not unintentionally. But what, um, what we do is, uh, well, so one of the factors that really controls this is that Mars and Earth only align every 26 months for us to land something. And uh, that 26 months might be in the summer on Mars when it's extremely windy and dusty, or it might be in the winter when you have a very calm atmosphere to land through. We're at the mercy of that calendar. We can't choose the time ourselves. So we have to design these landing systems to be able to take anything from those calm conditions to uh, the middle of a bad dust storm on Mars. And so everything is built very strong for that. That's fantastic. Um, you should tell me when you want to move on to the next slide. But uh, I just got to say, they did this in one of the Star Trek films. They made it look easy. But somehow, I think it was a lot more difficult. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, this was difficult. In fact, um, you know, we, we launched the, the uh, rover on a big rocket, uh, which of course, you know, seems very common these days, but that was very nerve wracking. And then it goes for about eight and a half months, just floating in space, drifting towards Mars, very safe time for everything. And then there's seven minutes from when it encounters the atmosphere of Mars, and it has to go in with a heat shield, a parachute has to come off, this uh, spacecraft with the rockets firing has to drop out of that parachute at the right time and fly the spacecraft, the rover down. The rover's wheels have to deploy. The, the, the jetpack has to lower the rover down. And then finally it lands. And all that's in seven minutes. And we're completely helpless here on Earth because by the speed of light, we can't control it. So the rover does all this by itself using the software that we write. And we just sit here curled up in a ball on the floor hoping that it all works. I think in English football they refer to that as squeaky bum time. But, um, <laughs> but when, when you actually released the, uh, the rover, presumably this, uh, th this uh, jet that was, was lowering it then just flies off and destro destroys itself somewhere, does it? That's right. Yeah. Uh, so once that spacecraft lowers the rover on a tether and the rover is confirmed, we waited two seconds for the rover to make sure it was stable and actually on the ground. Then the cables are cut, and we throttle up that jetpack, and it flies as far away as it can and, and crashes in a safe distance. Very good. We're already leaving litter, but never mind. <laughs> That's right. This is a great achievement. Should we move to the next slide? Yeah. Sure. OK. So here's a picture oh. of our landing site. Yep. One second. This is not advancing. Oh. There we are. Great. This is a picture of our landing site. It's a beautiful place. Um, what we landed in is a big crater, about 150 kilometers across. And inside that crater, there's a mountain. And that mountain has different layers of rock that make it up. And that's really what we hope to study with this uh, rover. We want to climb through every one of these layers, which have recorded what the environment on Mars was like 
three billion years ago. So this is a very old place, but these rocks will tell us whether there was a lot of water on Mars and maybe even whether there was life on Mars. So what you're seeing here in the foreground is some reddish rocks, and then you transitions to some grayer rocks, and then behind that there's even higher and higher levels of the mountain. And we uh, have, of course, already been exploring for seven years and have driven 21 kilometers, climbing up over 400 meters so far on this mountain. That's fantastic. One of the striking things to me is, for all its bleak, it does look so much like Earth in many ways. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And that's one of the things that I find most profound about Mars exploration, too, is that it's not some exotic place like you might see in a science fiction movie. It really is something very similar to what you'd find in a desert in Africa or in a desert in California, even. Uh, and it just makes you wonder, why isn't there life on Mars like there is on Earth? Indeed. Though I must say, I'm a fan of the old Doctor Who, which was all filmed in quarries, so it always looked a bit like this. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to move to the next slide? Sure. Okay. Yeah, this third slide um, shows what it looks like now that we're uh, 400 meters uh, higher on the mountain, looking back at where we landed. So you can see that uh, marker that says Bradbury Landing. Uh, that's where we actually came dropping down out of the sky, landing on the floor of this crater. And then we followed that path first to the right, to Yellowknife Bay. And then we drove towards the left to other places called Darwin and Cooperstown. Uh, and then slowly started ascending higher and higher to where we got to where this picture was taken, 400 meters high, looking across this crater floor. And, and is the rover still in that vicinity, or is it moved on? Uh, it's still um, pretty close to where this uh, image was taken. Uh, this image was taken on the top of a little local ridge where we could have a nice view. And now we're behind that ridge, exploring a place where there's a lot of clay minerals on the ground. And clay is something that uh, happens when minerals are formed, when water interacts with rocks. And we find that, of course, very interesting. Okay, uh, we should, I'm sure we will come back to that. The other thing I see on the picture, you note the, the, the top of the crater rim. So how high is that crater wall above the, the base where, of where you landed? Yeah, so that, uh, the floor of the crater there, the distance between that and the crater uh, wall is probably about three or four kilometers in this picture. And it's probably about 30 or 40 kilometers from where the picture was taken. So this is a huge, vast uh, vista uh, view that we're, that we're looking at. And it's, it's really a, quite a beautiful place in the winter when it's clear. In the summer, when the dust kicks up, we can no longer see any of that crater rim because it looks like a, a bad day of pollution um, here on Earth, but it's really just dust on Mars. I have, I have two questions. Um, one maybe shared by some members in the audience. How do you come up with the names for these places? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Every mission is different um, on Mars. Uh, we chose to come up with the names based on sites where really important geol geological discoveries were made on Earth. For example, places in Australia, places in Canada, uh, places nice. in uh, Scotland where some of the big discoveries about the history of Earth were made. Um, and then, uh, like a twofold question, really. How often are you getting images, photographs like this back? And the second question, um, last year at our next festival, where Roger and I and the Big Bang Collective are heading next week in the United Kingdom at WOMAD, last year we did a link to Hubble headquarters. And the team there ran us through how they uh, operate the Hubble telescope and how the images, I think everybody knows the beautiful images that Hubble is sending back from space that are very colored. Are you doing any of that touching up on this, or is this really real color as it is? That's a great question. So thanks for asking that. So we have um, images that come down from the rover nearly every day, uh, not just for science, but also because the images are our eyes uh, for all of the engineers and scientists who run the mission. So at the very minimal, uh, we have to send all of the black and white images that are used to uh, drive the rover. And, and, and these are all images that are three, in three-dimensional. They're stereo images taken with two eyes. 
So the rover and the engineers who operate it can actually see in 3D vision and choose the best path for the rover. Uh, we also send, of course, lots of color pictures. Those take a little bit more bandwidth, a little bit more data, so we can't send that many big panoramas. But um, your question about color uh, and, and um, enhancing the images, we try not to do much at all, really, to change the true nature of the images. We don't want to uh, distort them at all. But what we do, um, how we do process them, is to remove the orange color that comes from the sunlight on Mars filtering through the dusty atmosphere. So we remove that orange color so that the colors are what a human would see if they were looking at these rocks with a, a, a white light that did not have the filtering by the sun, by the dust. Okay, so the real view would be a little bit redder and gloomier because of that dust, is that right? That's right, it would, it would look very orange. And what we'd like our geologists to be able to do is look at a rock on Mars, recognize that this is a bit of a greenish rock, this is a bit of a bluish rock, and therefore be able to use their experience on Earth to understand what that rock is. Yeah, and presumably that reddish color is the same effect as when you see sunsets or sunrise on Earth. It's the, the lots of material that's scattering the light as it comes in through the atmosphere. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, Mars has a lot of dust in the atmosphere, and it's all orange. Uh, and so when the sun is coming through the atmosphere, whether at noon or extremely much more at sunset or sunrise, you get this orange light that hits everything. Yeah, I saw some smiles in the crowd. Sorry, it's a physicist asking a question. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to move to the next slide? Sure. So this next slide is one of my favorites. Uh, this is one of our selfies that we've taken, our self-portraits. Uh, we figured out that the camera on the end of the arm can be used to take pictures of the rover itself. It takes about 50 pictures to stitch together a, a, a selfie like this. Um, so not quite as easy as using your mobile phone. Uh, but we get this beautiful view of the rover itself operating on Mars. And if you look down at that rock below the rover and to the left of the rover, there's a little hole in it. And this is one of our big accomplishments. We drill into these rocks and we gather that powder and we analyze it in our laboratories. And the big discoveries that we've made so far are uh, really there's two major discoveries. One is that almost every rock we've drilled has contained clay minerals, which means that there was a lot of water breaking down the volcanic rocks that Mars first formed with. And two, uh, many of the rocks contain organic molecules, carbon-based molecules of the kind that are simple forms of the kinds of organic molecules that make up all of our cells, all of the proteins in our body, all those things. We found simple versions of those on Mars, so not quite clear evidence of life, but at least we know now that Mars has that raw material, those organic molecules that life could use if it ever took hold. That's really exciting stuff. Can, can I ask one other question, which is a when question? So you're finding that there's clays here in this rock, uh, and all the other materials, but you're finding it in a really big crater. Now, as I understand it, a lot of those really big craters happened quite early when the planets formed in the Great Bombardment. Is this one of those Great Bombardment craters? And that would tell you a little bit about when all of the water was around and the, the, the materials. I'm asking a complete non-expert question here, so tell me if I'm wrong. No, that's great. It, no, you're on the right track. So. Um, one thing that uh, is some background about Mars, it, today it's a very cold and dry and we really think a lifeless place. But when we look at pictures uh, of the oldest terrains, we actually can see clear evidence that streams of water and rivers float across the surface. Uh, this is actually you know, very well determined uh, that water was a lot more abundant. Mars was even, you might even call it Earth-like, about three billion years ago. So it was important for us to go to a place, one of these ancient craters, as you say, like formed about three or four billion years ago, to find a place that dated from that time when all the water was present. And so we think that these rocks that we're studying are actually the sediment, the, the, the silt and mud that was carried in those streams and then laid down on this crater floor. That's why this landing site is so important to us. That's fantastic. 
And, and just for my information, between the rocks, is, is this is dust-like material or is it clay-like material? Uh, so the rocks are clay-like material okay. uh, and also volcanic uh, material. Uh, but the, uh, the dust that coats everything is, is, of course, dust that's just from the modern atmosphere. And do you, do you have a lot of trouble with that, with your, with your, uh, your drive system, your wheels? Yeah. I know I've driven on sand. It's not fun. So I wondered if you had right. any problems like that. Yeah, we avoid sand. Uh, we really, you know, this rover would not do well if it tried to drive across sand. But fortunately, we can look at uh, this area from the satellites that we have at Mars and map it all out. So it's great to be in an era when we have satellites above us and rovers on the surface. So we're not driving into the unknown. We're really driving on a map almost uh, to explore this crater. OK, that's great. I think there's one more slide. Is that correct? Is there one more uh, after this one, Ashwin? There's uh, two more if you have time. Yes. I can talk through those. OK. Uh, so the next one, uh, I just wanted to show this one. And you mentioned sand. That's a great uh, introduction to this slide. <laughs> So in addition to the um, ancient rocks that are 3 billion years old, these orange rocks that we drill into in this picture, there's ha there has been 3 billion years of history from the time those rocks were formed till now. And what has been happening in the last few billion years on Mars is just a lot of wind blowing sand around. And so you get these big piles of sand like the one that's in the background of this picture. This is a dune, a sand dune, that's actually moving about one meter per year in the direction that the picture was taken. So if we had gotten stuck here and were not able to drive again, we would be covered up in about three or four years by this sand pile. But the sand is interesting and we study it too, but it probably doesn't contain any evidence of potential life because it's so recent. Wow, that's impressive. Okay, perhaps if we go to the last, last, the last slide. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the last beautiful. slide. Just shows you, yeah, it is beautiful. It I is, really, yeah. this mountain is just a gorgeous uh, part of Mars. And this picture is shot in the direction of where, we'll, where we will be climbing for the next three or four or five years with Curiosity. And we hope the rover lasts that long. It's been seven years. It was designed to operate for two years. But of course, we always expect and hope that the rovers last longer than that. So we think that over the next five years, we'll climb through what's shown here on this picture, and we'll get to even more uh, geologic layers that record younger and younger and younger times on Mars, where we can ask the same questions again. Uh, how much water was present? Are there carbon-based molecules present? And was there a potential for Mars to support life uh, at the times these rocks were formed? That's great. This is exciting. Stuff. Can I just ask a couple of questions about the future and, and then perhaps yeah. we go to I, the... I had just one question now. Looking at this, what are your upcoming targets for the, for the project? Do you have, like, you know, uh, 25th of December, we want to reach the top of this hill? Or how, how does it work? You set yourself some milestones or...? We do. We, we set ourselves... We have a mix. So we set ourselves general milestones where over the next two years, three years, we'd like to get to this next layer on Mars. Uh, but we also realize that we've never been here before. This is only uh, the, you know, maybe the sixth or seventh time we've ever landed uh, on Mars and, and only the third time we've roved on Mars. So there's going to be a lot of unexpected discovery. And so we allow the fact that maybe we won't actually make it in two years because it's much more important to stay where we are now and follow up on a discovery that we've made. And, and how long do you think the mission will continue? Uh, we're hoping for another at least three to five years. Uh, it could go on longer, uh, but we're getting to the point where uh, some of the electronics and some of the mechanisms on the rover are starting to show the signs that they're much beyond what they were designed for. Uh, we had some issues where we had to work around a problem with our drill then we had to fix a problem with the computer's memory. Uh, and by fix, it's, you know, we can't send anybody to Mars to fix them. So we just have to invent ways of operating the rover to avoid using that motor or avoid using that piece of memory. So far, we can do that. But at some point, the number of those problems will increase more and more as the rover ages. But we're hoping that's still a long ways off. 
Yeah, and presumably that's where the replica you have back in Pasadena is really important. You can try things out on that to see if you can make things work, yeah? That's an excellent point. So, yeah, getting back to what's behind me, this, uh, this model served a lot of purposes. Before we landed, this was the model that we learned how to drive with. So, you know, outside of this little room we're in, there's actually a yard the size of a soccer pitch that we drive the rover across and, uh, and take three-dimensional images of, um, of all the rocks and learn how to navigate the rover. And then now, it, because it has all the same electronics and motors as what's on Mars, we can diagnose any problems that occur using this test bed. That's terrific. I have, I have a, a question. Looking at that, um, thinking about these big Hollywood movies, Ashwin, that they're producing, and I think the one where Matt Damon got stuck on Mars, or I don't know what it was, Interstellar, and he Red grew Red his Red own, what was it called? Was it Red Interstellar? The Martian. Martian. The Martian. Red it grew his own carrots and tomatoes and all of that stuff. Right. Um, do they come to you and, and get your advice and say, is this, does this correspond to how the rover and how your team are, are seeing Mars? Or are they just kind of just winging <laughs> it and trying to make it look as fantastic as possible? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, we're, we're here, you know, 15 miles from Hollywood. Uh, and the amount of time they ask all those good questions is less than they should. So most of the movies are really not that accurate. But The Martian was an exception. The Martian was based on a book written by a, an engineer who tried to get a lot of it right. And in fact, right where I'm standing, uh, Matt Damon and Jessica Chastain were here in this room. Uh, and uh, we're asking our engineers a lot of questions about how to get it right on Mars in their movie. That's really nice to hear. It's mm -hmm. good because it has so much influence on how people view technologies, space, science. Yeah, I hope they do more of that. Can Niveta, I, can we bring can we bring Ashwin up for? Yeah, but can I ask one? Last, well, we could do that, but yeah, while we're doing it, can I ask is. one last question, He's Ashwin? Back again. Which is again about the future. I get the impression that there's probably going to be a traffic jam in near Mars orbit in the next year or two. Maybe you could just say a couple of words about future rover projects, because I think yeah, it's curiosity is not going to be lonely for very long. That's right. So um, looking backwards for for a second. Uh, we lost our only other companion recently, our only other rover companion, Opportunity, which reached Mars in 2004, uh, operated for almost uh, 15 years and just uh, stopped operating in the last uh, several months. So we're currently the only rover on Mars. There's another lander called InSight, which looks at Mars quakes. Uh, but soon we will be joined by at least three other rovers that I'm aware of, uh, one from NASA, a follow-on that will look and land much like Curiosity, but will aim to collect samples of rocks and put them, seal them in tubes, which one day will be returned to Earth. Then there'll be a European uh, orbiter, I'm sorry, a European rover uh, called ExoMars, which will reach the uh, surface around the same time as, as the Mars 2020 NASA rover does, sometime in uh, early 2021. Uh, and then there will also be, I, I, from what I understand, a Chinese rover that will probably arrive at a similar time in 2021. So it'll be a busy place, and Curiosity will no longer be lonely on Mars. It'll have its own festival up there, I think, yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, I think I hand back to, uh, to Connie now so we can do some questions. Is so does right? anybody have any questions for uh, Ashwin over there in California? Yeah, can you shout it out, and I'll try and repeat it. Is it in English, or would you like the translator? Okay. okay. So should I shout? Yeah, because I'm, well, so I hear just right? a minute, let me, I, I can try. Oh. I can try and <coughs> climb a mountain. Do you want to pass it back to me? It's a health and safety question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, hello, thank you. Do you hear me? Yes, I hear uh, you. I have a question. You mentioned that the ultimate goal with uh, rovers on Mars is to possibly detect life on Mars. So, I have a question. Uh, how uh, how do you actually ensure that the life that you might possibly decide detect on Mars is not a like a passenger from Earth? Like how how do you sterilize the rovers before you send them to Mars? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a very important for NASA to um, to do two things: to protect Mars from Earth contamination. We actually have an aim to make sure we don't contaminate Mars with these spacecraft that we sent. 
And then also we want to make sure that the science we're doing uh, is accurate by not going to Mars and then detecting someone's hair uh, that helped build curiosity. Uh, so we assemble these rovers in an extremely clean environment. Every part on Curiosity was sterilized and made uh, very clean. And then the rover itself is assembled in a clean room. It can't be sterilized because of all the electronics and everything on board, but we assemble it in a, in a way that reduces the amount of contamination to extremely low levels that we think Mars environment will kill off itself. Mars has a very harsh environment now. Uh, so we, we take a lot of care, and no one has ever touched these rovers. They wear complete gowns and, uh, and keep it very clean. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir, in the middle. Yes. Uh, how they uh, write slash uh, test their, so their software, for example, software updates? Uh, how do you write slash test your software in your software updates? Yeah, so um, we uh, the rover has um, a total, from what I understand, of over 500,000 lines of code. Uh, we can update the rover's software. This is something we couldn't do with early NASA spacecraft. But these days, they're basically like modern computers where we can uh, move out different versions of the software. So when we landed, we used a lot of the code to contain uh, the software that was used to steer the, surf, uh, steer the rover down to Mars. Then we upgraded the software with all the new capabilities to use the arm and drive once we landed. And so that is all done by a team of software engineers here. Um, and uh, then we update the software on this model behind me first and make sure it, it is very uh, carefully tested. Uh, only then we will send up the software to the rover on Mars. We have two computers, so we can always maintain an old version of the software and a new version. All the same things you'd like to do when you're updating your software on your computer on Earth, we have to do that on Mars, too, just to be safe. Any other questions? Yes, down the front here. Hello. Do any Hello. US university participate in the 2020 rover? Uh, yes, so on um, all NASA, NASA missions, the engineering teams are based at the NASA centers who design and test and build the rover and, and then fly it and operate it. But the scientists are selected by NASA from all over the world, and many of them are at universities across the world. So with Curiosity, we have you know 60% uh, of a team of 500 people. Uh, so I guess 300 of those people are at universities and other institutions in the U.S., and 200 of those people are at universities and other institutions around the world. And so these are, um, if you want to be on the mission as a university professor, you, you write a proposal to NASA, and then NASA will have a competition, and they select the ones that are the, the best for the mission. Now you know what to do. <laughs> After this show, I'll give you an Ashwin's uh, email address. <laughs> Any more questions? Is there anybody on this side that we didn't spot? Uh, right, there are two right up at the back. Um, okay, I'm going to give you the mic. Guys, just do like a human chain back here and pass it on up so Ashwin can hear you. Hello to California. Uh, Hello. I know that the, the question would be uh, kind of out of uh, the topic of this, this day, but how realistic is the prospect of actually people getting to Mars in our life, lifetimes, for example? Yeah, it, it's a great question. Um, I think we're closer than we have ever been, uh, but there's still a lot to do before we have learned fully how to safely send uh, humans to Mars. These robots are part of that because, as I mentioned, we've gone from a rover uh, this size to a cart size to a car size. And every time we go up a factor of two, a factor of five, a factor of 10 in the size and, and weight of things we can land, we have to go probably another factor of 10 from Curiosity to be able to land people and all of their equipment on Mars. So we're learning how to do that with these robots, but eventually we'll have to learn how to land something much heavier. And that's just, of course, one of the many challenges. We also have to learn how to bring enough food and water or extract water from the Mars environment. 
Uh, we have to learn how to protect humans from the radiation that's present in space and at the surface. But to answer your question, uh, you know, it's, it's a matter not only of technology, but of course of um, politics and money and all those other factors that come into play when you're doing something of that scale. Uh, and so it's nice that uh, the United States and many countries around the world still see Mars exploration as something uh, that is important, significant scientifically, and significant for their countries. So I think you know the way that we will get it done is when many countries work together to put people on Mars, hopefully in the next you know, 20, 30 years, I, I hope. I hope we'll still be alive for it. Uh, I'd certainly love to see it. There was one question. Hi, I want to ask what was the biggest discovery of the mission so far? Yeah, um, the biggest discovery of the mission really is, um, you know, I, I, I'll cheat a little and say it's not a single discovery, but it's, it's the summary of our discoveries when we're asking all these questions about whether Mars could have supported life. So before Curiosity, we did not know the answer to that. Uh, we knew that there was water on Mars, but water isn't enough for life if there's not the nutrients that life requires, the, the chemicals that make up all of our cells, and energy that life can use to survive. So we, we wanted to find a place that had water, that had carbon and other important chemicals for life, and had energy sources that life could use, all in one place, all in one time on Mars. And at this crater, uh, Gale Crater, three billion years ago, all of, those, uh, all of those criteria were met, so we were able to declare with this mission that Mars was indeed a habitable place. We have not been able to find life that made use of those conditions, but we're still looking, and the 2020 rover and the ExoMars rover from Europe will be our best chance of, ask, of answering that question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashwin. Uh, it's been fascinating for me. Um, and we're going to have to wrap up now. But before we let you go back to your day job, um, we, I think you have two questions. People who have been listening very closely, I'm sorry, we don't have any more time for questions. But he's going to ask the audience. And Roger and I are going to be looking. Because when we did this earlier on with the incredible Mark Looney, it was kind of, we, we need to see your hand up and, and get the answer right. And we've got a couple of little gifts. So Ashwin, if you want to fire away the first question. OK. Um, we'll see if these are too hard or too easy. But the first question is, how much does curiosity weigh? Ooh. Yeah, I think this one. One ton? That's, that's the right answer. Okay. How many kilograms for even more? <laughs> even <laughs> bonus points. <laughs> OK, one yes. ton. You get One it. ton, 1,000 uh, kilograms. So I have a choice here for you. So I was at Johnson Space Center a couple of months ago and raided the gift shop. Um, we've got a notepad with a pen for their Unite um, program, or there is the backpack. Which one would you like? Okay, the, notepad. the notepad. Could you pass that back to him? Thank you. And then the final question, Ashwin. OK. Yeah, this may be a harder one. Um, but how many kilometers did the rover drive on Mars? Uh uh, this gentleman, Roger, are you thinking? I think so. Yeah, okay, Sorry, what's your answer? How many? 23. 23, uh, Ashwin? Close, but Ooh. not quite. Ooh. <laughs> now, now I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> this young lady was really fast. What's your answer, sweetie? 21. 21? You got it. Yay! <laughs> Here we go. All right, so we want to thank everybody. Please, let's say a big thank you uh, uh, to Ashwin Vasaveda for giving up his time today over in California. Stay safe with all those earthquakes over there. Um, thank you. We hope this is the first of many links that we're going to have with our wonderful colleagues between me at CERN, uh, Roger Lancaster, uh, Roger uh, Jones at Lancaster, and uh, why are you pointing like that? Oh, he's going good. All right. You're going to get a big thank you. <laughs> I am crazy, but there is logic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashwin.
Thank you very much. We'll Thanks talk everybody. to you soon. Bye-bye.